Welcome back to my basic tutorial series. Last time we learned about ground units, so now we will move on to air units. Unlike ground units which can stay in any land province, air units have to be stationed at air bases. These small icons are air bases, and the filled ones have air units in them while the transparent ones are empty. Hovering over these bases will tell you what units are there, as well as the maximum capacity of the airbase. In this case, there is an air group stationed here that consists of four multi-role fighter wings. You can tell they are multi-role fighters because of the icon. We are also told that the base can repair a maximum of 10 units each day efficiently, so if you need to repair more than that, you should reroute them to a different airbase if possible. If we select the province the airbase is in, we can check the level of the airbase and the province information. As we can see, it's a level 10 airbase, which is the maximum and cannot be improved further. If we now instead look at the empty airbase in Birmingham, only 5 units can be repaired there, so it must be a level 5 base. To upgrade this base, select the province and click the airbase icon in the province information as many times as you'd like to improve it. Doing so will add a new project to your production screen. Note that it's a serial run as indicated by the plus 4 here, so while this doesn't take a lot of IC, it's going to take a lot of time. The way to speed this process up is to instead build airbases directly. While our serial run says Birmingham, which means that it will go there automatically, these manually produced airbases have no target province yet, so once they are finished you can place them in provinces just like you do with units. It will still take some time to assemble it there, but it's much faster than building improvements through the province information. You can also build a new airbase from scratch which works exactly the same way. Clicking on these bases will select the units that are inside. You can either single click on them with each click cycling through the units at that base or drag a box around the base to select all units that are stationed there where you can then reorganize or merge them. Once you have an air unit selected you can right click any province to issue an order. Depending on the target province and the type of aircraft you have selected, different mission types will be available. These are explained pretty well with the tooltips, but there are a couple I want to clarify. The difference between the air superiority and air intercept missions is that on intercept, your fighters will actively try to intercept incoming enemy aircraft, while on superiority, they will just fly around more randomly and engage enemy aircraft they happen to come across. So if you know there are incoming enemy bombers, you'll want to use intercept, but to just clear the skies above enemy territory to support bombers of your own, air superiority is the better choice. When the target province belongs to you and there is an airbase present there, reserve and rebase missions will be available. Rebase simply moves air units from one base to another. Reserve puts the selected units on standby on the target airbase and they will be used to reinforce damaged air units returning from missions so they can get back to the action quicker. This works in conjunction with the priority setting for the mission. The priority you set here determines the air unit's priority for reinforcements from units that are on the reserve mission. Note that for this to work, the unit on the mission and the unit on reserve must have the same home base. So then, we can also set the stance for the mission, and this defines how much strength and organization the unit is allowed to lose before they abort their mission. The unit on passive will return to base at the slightest trouble, while the unit on aggressive will keep attacking even when it's heavily damaged. Defensive is somewhere in between. You'll have to decide how important any given mission is to you and how much you're willing to sacrifice to get it done. So as you probably noticed by now, this circle is the mission range. This range uses the unit's home base as its center, so sometimes you can rebase the unit to a different airbase to get into range of a certain target. A target doesn't have to be just a single province though. With the area selection tool, you can choose a variety of different target areas for your missions. The default is a single province, 
but you could also target a region. What provinces belong to what regions can be seen with the region map mode, and the regions also have slightly bolder lines surrounding them in other map modes. Another option is the cone, which has the three sliders enabled for range, angle and width. Now for these sliders I find it best to use the plus and minus signs to the sides of the sliders to adjust these, as you can instantly see the changes instead of only when you let go of the slider. If you move the sliders directly, it only updates once you let go, which makes it harder to get it to where you want it to be. The last area you can target is a circle, for which you can set the range with the slider. For cones and circles, right-clicking the map will change the range, not the center of the area as you would expect. If you want to change the center now, you have to switch back to the single province target, right-click the target, and then switch back to the cone or circle. Finally, we have the time controls for the mission. You can set your aircraft to fly the missions only at day, at night, or both, and I'd suggest flying only at day most of the time, as that's when your aircrafts are most effective. You can also choose whether you want the mission to run continuously until you cancel it, or choose a specific time frame for the mission. If you do set them to continuous, you must make sure you eventually stop the mission. If you forget about it, they'll be wasting fuel on something that might be a waste of time at that point. Let's try this out now and set our strategic bombers to attack some German ground units. Our unit arrived almost instantly and started its attack run. With the unit selected, just like with ground units, we have the battle information available. The battle itself works similarly to a ground battle, only that sometimes one side won't even be able to return fire. Perhaps the most important aspect of air combat is the stacking penalty. Every type of battle in the game uses a sort of stacking penalty, which makes units less and less effective the more of them there are defending or attacking the same area. For air units it's very simple. Every single air unit beyond the first one that enters the same air battle adds a 10% stacking penalty. A single interceptor has no stacking penalty, but if you send in two, both of them get a 10% penalty and fight at only 90% effectiveness. As you can see, at 11 wings the stacking penalty reaches its maximum of 100% and your units will all fight at 0% effectiveness. When attacking ground targets it's even worse, as the stacking penalty actually starts with a single air wing. So if you send two bombers to attack a ground target, both of them will get a 20% penalty. Let's take a look at how air-to-air -air combat stacking penalties weaken your units. We'll say each wing has a maximum combat strength of 100, so with 15 wings, each on their own, you would have a total combat strength of 1500. But what happens if you send all those wings into the very same air combat situation at the same time? As you can see, the maximum strength of 300 is achieved with 5 units, 6 bringing no further improvements, and your units actually become weaker the more you send in after that. The reasoning behind this is that each air wing you build in the game represents 100 aircraft of that type. Just imagine a thousand aircraft attacking the same target. That just can't work. So what you want to do is send out small squads of air units between two and five wings, but no more than that. And be careful not to have two of these squads attack the same target, as even if they have different commanders, if they fight in the same battle, they all count towards the same stacking penalty. Now while we're on the subject of stacking penalties, let's also take a look at how this affects land units. For land units the calculation is a bit more complicated, but also doesn't set in as quickly or as heavily as with air units. When attacking a province from a single direction, you can send in up to four divisions without any stacking penalty. As soon as a fifth division comes in, all your units in that battle will suffer a 10% stacking penalty. Now unlike with air units, this doesn't increase in a perfectly linear fashion so it doesn't go from 10 to 20 to 30 and so on, but slows down slightly with every further division. 
So with 6 divisions, all your units will suffer a 19% penalty. 7 divisions cause a 27% penalty, and so on. Let's see the effects of this. Each division here again has a maximum combat strength of 100, so ideally we want 1500 from 15 divisions. As we see here though, we can only get to about 500 before the stacking penalty becomes so high that we get weaker the more we send in. An important thing to remember about this is that all divisions in the battle count, including any reserve divisions that are just waiting to enter the actual fight. So while theoretically we would reach our maximum strength here at about 9 divisions, you cannot get all 9 of those into actual combat due to the frontage limitations. Unless of course you are using divisions with just one width, in which case you could fit 11 into a single front, but that wouldn't be very efficient. So if we assume that just 4 of our divisions will actually fight at the same time, sending in any more than that is bad for us. Those extra divisions that don't fit into the frontage will just sit and wait in reserve while weakening the divisions that are fighting. This is just an example and depending on the combat width of your divisions, you might be able to fit in just 3 or maybe 6 divisions. But the issue stays the same anyway. This means that ideally you'll want to send in just as much as you can fit into the frontage, then as your units grow weaker, send in reinforcements in preparation to replace the fleeing units. Of course, doing this all the time requires way too much micromanagement. But if there is a very important battle that you absolutely must win, then consider using this to maximize your strength. These examples assume that you are attacking from just a single province, and attacking from multiple provinces not only increases the maximum frontage as we know, but also causes the stacking penalty to set in a bit later. For example, when attacking from three directions at once, you can actually send in 10 divisions total instead of just 4 without any stacking penalty. Furthermore, the theater commander can reduce the stacking penalty by 1% per skill level and you can also research the human wave doctrine, which increases the unit cooperation. That actually just means that your units will be affected less by the stacking penalty. Let's now move on to naval units. Controlling naval units work similarly to air units. They are stationed at naval bases that, just like air bases, have a maximum repair capacity. Select any fleet and right-click a target province to open the mission menu. You could move to a specific area, patrol the area surrounding a target, or try to raid enemy convoys that may be passing through the area. Raiding convoys is especially useful once you have control of the seas, as destroying enemy convoys not only hurts their economy, but also their national unity due to strategic warfare impact. If you switch to the naval map mode, you can see all your active convoy routes, and your naval bases are larger on the map. Red lines indicate outgoing convoys, while green lines indicate incoming convoys. If you now target an area a convoy passes through, you get an additional mission option to protect that route from raiding, just in case it's your convoys that are in danger. There is also an air map mode, by the way, which shows you the range of your aircraft and makes air bases more visible. Another thing that you can do with naval units is shore bombardment. Simply move a fleet to an area adjacent to a land battle and they will assist the ground forces with shore bombardment. Note that this is only visible as a negative modifier on the enemy units in the combat details. Carrier air wings can also lend support to land battles. If you select a fleet which contains carriers with CAGs, you can see them listed below the ships. Clicking this button will select all of them and they behave just like normal air units, except they have a mobile base. If you like, you can even take these CAGs and rebase them to a normal airbase. So when two opposing fleets meet, they will enter fleet combat. Both fleets try to get into firing range to start attacking the enemy fleet. How fast they can do so depends on the average speed of the fleet. At the same time, they are trying to get into good attack positions. The larger your fleet is, 
the bigger your positioning penalty is, which makes it harder to get good positions. If your positioning is bad, your ships will miss more often and can even hit friendly targets. A good leader can counteract this. As we can see, our Admiral has a 40% positioning bonus thanks to his skill level. Each skill level grants a 10% positioning bonus. Once in range, the ship will choose a target and start firing. Here we can see all the ships currently in the battle. Some of them are already fighting, but most of the enemy fleet is still trying to close the distance. As the British fleet here includes several capital ships, their speed is much slower than mine, so my ships can start firing sooner. Unfortunately, speed isn't everything and my fleet doesn't really stand a chance here. There's even two aircraft carriers, which can send out their air groups to attack before the naval battle even starts. Another advantage of carriers is that their own strength or organization loss has no effect on their air groups. So while a carrier that has lost all of its organization can no longer move, that doesn't stop its aircraft from attacking, as they are separate units that merely use the carrier as their base. If we select our fleet, we can see that they are not only engaged in a naval battle, but also in another one. These are actually the enemy carrier air groups bombing my ships. Note that carrier air groups on naval missions have only 25% of the normal air unit stacking penalty, so you can send in much more than the usual limit of 5 or 6 wings. Our fleet's positioning penalty can be seen here. Each ship has a certain hull size which determines how much damage it can take. Every point of hull size of your whole fleet combined that is above 10 gives you a 4% penalty to your positioning. While positioning penalties aren't as dangerous as stacking penalties for ground and air units, you should still try to keep this number low to make sure your fleets fight as well as possible. Anything below about 30% should be fine. By the way, you can always see all the battles you are currently involved in in this tab on the right. I also want to mention that you don't have to worry too much about integrating your air and naval units into your order of battle. The only thing they benefit from is supply usage reduction, both from the army group level bonus and the logistic wizard trait, but it's hard to use that as naval and air units operate over long distances and the army group HQ range is limited to 600 kilometers. Usually, you'll just have them attached to your theater HQs, or even just leave them on their own. The last thing I want to touch on are transports. For naval transports, all you need is a fleet with transports stationed in a naval base, and one or more divisions to load onto it. Then select the division, and if there is enough space for it, click the load button. Your unit is now on the fleet, and you can see it here. Now you can either target a friendly naval base and use a transport order to move your land units there, or you can target any coastal province and use the invasion order to attack the province with an amphibious assault. Note that marines are by far the best brigades for the job. For paratroopers, you need transport planes and paratroopers in the same province. The paratroopers also have to be at least at 95% of their maximum organization. Once that's ready, you can load them in and use the now available airborne assault mission to attack with your paratroopers. Note you can also use transport planes to drop supplies to units that desperately need them. Alright, that should conclude this episode. Thank you very much for watching and see you next time.